and grace. Is the church today in trouble? Because there is a confusion between law and grace. And I'll tell you, I have listened to dozens and dozens and dozens of seeker-friendly sermons. And I am telling you, it is just amazing. I cannot believe how just so, you know, do-oriented these pastors are. It's just unbelievable. Anyway, let me get to the post. Here it is. And this is... uh, This is what it says. Christians must avoid the theological misstep of confusing God's law and God's gospel. Tully and Chavidgen told that this is what Tully and Chavidgen told attendees to the uh, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention 2015 and Power Conference at First Baptist Euless on February 24th. Chavidgen, pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Lauderdale, Florida, said law and gospel are both essential aspects of the Christian walk, but have become muddled together in sermons and therefore in the lives of Christians. Preaching from Romans 7, he said that while he hates to sound alarmist, he believes the church is in trouble because of this confusion. Quote, I'm convinced the church is in trouble, Chavidgen said. And the reason the church is in trouble is because pulpits are in trouble. And the reason pulpits are in trouble is because preachers fail to distinguish between God's law and God's gospel. Chavidjan said God's word comes in two forms, demands, or law, and deliverance, which is gospel. Both are important and necessary, but they have vastly different roles. He said a focus on law over grace leads Christians to believe that somehow, if they try really hard, they can attain the level of sanctification and holiness that pleases God by following his laws and commands. The problem with this mindset, he said, is that since God's standard is perfection, no one can rise to that level of excellence. The role of the law is to show people just how badly they need grace highlighting the unending ways they fall short of God's expectations. The focus and the foundation of the Christian faith is not living for God, Chavidjan said. The focus of the Christian faith is that God in Christ gloriously lived for us. That foundation produces fruit, but the root of the Christian faith is not living for God. It's the fact that God in Christ is living for us. Failure to distinguish between law and gospel always means the abandonment of the gospel because the law gets softened into helpful tips for practical living, while the gospel gets hardened into a set of demands that we have to live out. Chavidjan said that sermons should point out the severity of man's sinfulness, which shows people that they are a lot worse than they think they are. Then he said sermons should explain the infinite, unimaginable reality of God's grace. God's law, Chavidjan said, is for those that think they are good. His grace is for those that know they are bad. Both are equally important, he emphasized. But also crucial, uh, but also crucial is the church's commitment to allow both law and grace to have their own distinct jobs and roles in the life of Christians. This is a game changer, in my opinion, he said. Now, that is a really good article, and uh, but I, th- I think... That to show what Tullian was saying here, to kind of give a, an, an illustration, I want to go over to an article that was put out back on February 5th by Jeff Nichols from Liberate.org. And I posted this article on Facebook. Steve posted this article on Facebook. Really, really good article here. And I think it demonstrates exactly what Tullian Chavidjan was saying in his... Uh, in, in, er, in, in, in the last blog post. So the uh, title for the post that comes from Jeff Nichols is called Wounded and Weary Sinners Waiting for Good News That Never Comes. It says, I usually take a solo camping trip to the North Carolina mountains every Labor Day weekend. Sort of my way to hit the reset button. One of those outings, on one of those outings a couple of years ago, I decided one Sunday morning to head down the Blue Ridge Parkway on my way to a small rural church. It looked like a postcard from the outside. The parishioners inside warmly greeted this blue jean wearing scruffy stranger. It was awesome to sit with them in an old straight back wooden pew again and sing Amazing Grace. 
Then the sermon started. From the beginning, the, the pastor whacked us with the law. Nothing wrong with God's law. It shows us the standard, the standard we can't meet on our own. As I waited to hear the resuscitating words of the gospel, I realized they weren't going to come. With increasing intensity and sweat, the message was solely do more, try harder, get your act together. God is tired of sinners. His patience is wearing out. You're nowhere close of doing everything you can to please God. It was the elder brother from Jesus' parable of the lost son uh, up to that tiny stage with a message that wayward little brothers and sisters have no right to any feast. No right to a warm greeting from a father who joyfully runs out to greet sinners and welcome them back home over and over again. We hadn't heard any of that. Thundering law. Not even a whisper of the gospel. A scene too often played out in worship services, not just in the South, but across the world, in churches large and small. Wounded and weary sinners waiting for an announcement of good news that never comes. It turned out that he was a guest preacher. The church was looking for someone full-time. When he finally sat down after kneeling and wiping his brow, one of the elders stood up and said, Now this is the kind of man we've been missing. Someone unafraid to tell us like it and like... Uh, someone afraid to tell us and it like it is. When it was over... I eased out of the pew, lowered my head, and made a beeline to the parking lot, thinking I was the first soul to leave in such a haste and wondering why I hadn't gone for a nice hike instead. When I looked up, I saw the pastor's uh, college-age daughter already ahead of me on the way to their car. I'll never forget the look on her face, the very picture of beaten down, not an especially embarrassed or surprised look. She'd obviously heard all this before. Just weariness. Hopelessness. I wish to this day I would have said something to her, although I have no idea what that would have been. Maybe on the day before Labor Day, Jesus just... Maybe on the day... Maybe on the day before Labor Day, just Jesus' words from Matthew eleven twenty nine through 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Along with maybe the message we had all just sung, some in tears but never had heard spoken back to us, God's saving promise of amazing grace, the sound that revives, the sweetest sound. So that was uh, a short article, but a good one, put out by Jeff Nichols, um, uh, put up by the Liberate blog, and the article is by Jeff Nip Nichols. A uh, good example, a good illustration, I think, of uh, what most people hear from the pulpit every Sunday morning. Law, all law, no gospel. And that's a very sad thing. And I can tell you that I need it on a regular basis. And I tell I, I did, I listen, listen, I read... Uh, you know, I read encouraging devotionals and things like that that will point me to Christ on a daily basis because I need that again, as I said, on a daily basis. So now I want to play a sermon that was um, put up uh, oh, a few months ago by uh, Tully and Chavision's, uh podcast, Liberate. Uh, and the sermon comes from the series, How to Be Perfect. I think it's the uh, part 2A, or wait a minute, part, what, what did I say it was again? <laughs> part 1B, that's right. Um, but it's, it, it's a sermon series on the Ten Commandments, but it's not what you think. So I want to play this entire, entire sermon, and the reason, as I said, that I want to do this is because I want to contrast what you're hearing here with what you would hear on a typical uh, Sunday morning from uh, an evangelical church, just a typical evangelical church. And I'm using Stephen Furtick's Elevation as an example of that. So, without any further ado, here's Tully and Chavidjan's sermon from the series How to Be Perfect. So, I mentioned that what God gives us in the Ten Commandments, and we can all be very grateful for this, what God gives us in the Ten Commandments is a checklist on how to be perfect in just 10 simple steps. 
I began the series last week by saying that if you are into to-do lists, this sermon series is for you because God speaks so clearly here and he gives us a divine to-do list. He gives us a checklist of things that we must do if we ever hope to attain perfection. And so here in the Ten Commandments, he gives us this checklist, this checklist on how to be perfect. And it's really just ten simple, easy steps. You see, if we can just do these things perfectly, we can be perfect. But therein lies the problem. The problem that you and I face is that the Ten Commandments are too good for bad people like you and me. The Ten Commandments are not a description on how to be good. They are a demand that we be perfect. And as we know, the only thing that God accepts, the only thing that God approves of is perfection. We like to think that God accepts something smaller, our best efforts, our progress, however we define progress. But the fact of the matter is, and the Bible makes this clear, that the only thing God accepts, the only thing God approves is perfection. So if you are imperfect this morning and you are incapable of keeping all of these things that God lays out in the Ten Commandments perfectly, infallibly, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. Remember last week we talked about how God's law reaches down all the way inside of us, even to the level of motivation. It's not just that God requires we do everything right and perfectly on the outside. He demands that we want to do everything right and perfect on the inside all of the time. And so the Ten Commandments really are, in a sense, a wall that God intends for us to crash into so that we can see how small, how weak, how incapable we are. That's the only way our eyes will ever be fixed on Jesus, the one who came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it for us. I was um, interviewed a while back. And I was asked a number of questions. This was a written interview, so they sent me a bunch of questions, and then I wrote my answers in, and then they published it. But this was one of the questions that was asked of me. In what ways is grace most commonly misunderstood today? It's a good question. It's a question that really is on the forefront of lots of people's minds. In what ways is grace misunderstood? In what ways do we typically abuse grace? In what ways is grace most misunderstood in our day and age? And this was my answer. I think the main way that grace is misunderstood today is when people confuse it with cheapened law. Think of Jesus' crushing line in the Sermon on the Mount. You therefore must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Grace, for many Christians, is the reduction of God's expectations of us. Because of grace, we think we just need to try hard. Grace becomes this law-cheapening agent attempting to make the law easier to follow. So, be perfect gets cheapened into do your best. Most people think that those who talk a lot about grace have a low view of God's law. For the theologically minded in the room, that's where people who are myopic in their focus on preaching grace often get charged with the heresy of antinomianism, which is a fancy word that Martin Luther coined, which means anti-law. And so most people think that those who talk a lot about grace have a low view of God's law. Other people think that those with a high view of God's law are the legalists. But it's actually a low view of the law that produces legalism, since a low view of the law causes us to conclude that we can do it, that the bar is low enough for us to jump over. A low view of the law makes us think that the standards are attainable, the goals are reachable, the demands are doable. This means that the biggest problem facing the church today, and you've heard me say this before, is not cheap grace, but cheap law. The idea that God accepts anything less than the perfection of Jesus. 
Only when we see that the way of God's law is absolutely inflexible will we see that God's grace is absolutely indispensable. Uh